on materials which are called piezoelectrics. These are materials that convert between electrical and mechanical energies. And most of us use these without knowing about them. That's the guts of a medical ultrasound system. It's what's used for timing standards. And the core of my research group looks at how we can miniaturize those piezoelectric materials, how we can integrate them into useful devices, and make things that move and shake. So among the things we're working on are adjustable optics that may end up flying in the next generation X-ray space telescope. We're working on miniaturized medical ultrasound systems where if you're familiar with a normal ultrasound system is something this big and it's attached to a cart's worth of electronics, we work on trying to miniaturize the entire system so that you can put it in a pill and swallow it and that's to do investigation of diseases of the gastrointestinal tract. Uh, we work on devices that take motion of the human wrist and convert that to usable levels of power so that we can develop systems that are self-powered that help correlate human health and the environment. So if you have an asthmatic child and they walk into a room where the ozone concentration is high, the human body is a really bad ozone sensor, so we don't always know that that's the problem that we have this problem. But it will often trigger an asthma attack 24 hours later. And so, being able to provide real-time information to people, so that they can track their own health and then not have to charge the battery, is incredibly useful. So we work on things like that. The research in my group really breaks into three areas. The first area is really aimed at trying to understand the fundamentals that govern the magnitude of the material's response, as well as understanding the fundamentals of what makes them reliable, the materials reliable. So we look at all of the possible mechanisms that could contribute to the response, and we try and figure out how do we turn those mechanisms on and off. We try and understand the fundamentals of when a material degrades, there's coupled phenomena that interlink the electrical and the mechanical responses, and so we study the reliability under electric fields, under mechanical fields, and under combined electromechanical fields. So that's really the, the first third of my group. And in many cases, what drives that piece of my group is trying to understand how would we design a material for a particular application. So we look at figures of merit and say, what combination of materials properties do I really need to be able to have to make this material useful? The second chunk of my research group really does processing science. So now I have an interesting material. How do I make it? How do I make it at low temperatures? How do I put things on arbitrary substrates? How do I scale up to large enough sizes that a company will actually be willing to try things? And so we study mostly materials that have complex compositions, which means that I always have to handle how do I get the stoichiometry correct, and then how do I make sure I don't degrade that stoichiometry or the crystallinity when I pattern it to make useful things. And then the third portion of my group really does the microelectromechanical system. So we try and take the knowledge from those first two pieces and turn it into a device that functions. We all carry around piezoelectric microelectromechanical systems in our pockets. Um, the filters that are used in cell phones are piezoelectric MEMS devices. And there is enormous interest in being able to understand how will we do that filtering operation as we scale to the higher parts of the frequency band in the 5G frequency space. So that's an area of enormous commercial import. Many commercial printing systems use piezoelectric materials. And so if you look at you know, a big commercial printer that may be not just doing newspapers, but might be doing the printing of the tiles that go in buildings, um, so really large format printers, there is a lot of interest in being able to take the piezoelectric MEMS technology that my group and other groups are working on and scaling that to um, to, to this application so that we can do high resolution printing, we can print on demand, we can print on weird surfaces. 
Um, so those would be among the many commercial applications. Right now, piezoelectrics is roughly a billion dollar industry. I don't know that there's a single factor that does that. Um, I had fantastic mentoring growing, uh, growing through the academic system. I had the, the gentleman who was my thesis advisor was brilliant. He's the man who invented the composite transducer geometry that's now used in pretty much every medical ultrasound transducer in the world. Um, and he was also arguably the best teacher in materials, not just at Penn State, but pretty much across the world. He was, he was a fantastic mentor. And he invested very heavily in his students to try and figure out how could he make them successful? How could he teach them the life skills that they needed? And so that's certainly one important factor. In practice, the ability to work hard is also an important and persist in a field. Uh, the ability to think creatively in the face of, I have to engineer around what constraints? You know, these are all mutually incompatible. What, do I, what am I gonna do? So trying to be creative uh, is important. And then realistically having a sense of what matters in life. Um, a lot of that comes from, from my family. And so it's a mix, not a single answer to your question. That is a really hard question. <laughs> There's a number of things that have changed. Uh, there are simply more women in the field. And so that's, that's a real pleasure to have more collaborators that are a little more diverse in their backgrounds. The, from an academic standpoint, I find students today are probably better equipped with life skills in um, working in teams. They're probably better equipped with life skills at taking feedback. It's not always considered criticism, it's constructive rather than destructive. So those are some very positive changes. Um, coming with that, there's, there's much more anxiety amongst students on campus. And so that is something that faculty aren't always trained to deal with. And so learning how, how do you respond when there's a student in crisis is, is really an important thing that, that we're all learning how to do. Uh, from a funding perspective, uh, the generation before mine would often be funded for 30 years in a particular field. And funding increments now tend to be much shorter. And so figuring out how to be agile so that you, have, you can stay somewhere close to your core strength, but you can still find resources to support uh, education is, is also changed pretty markedly over the course of my career. So I wanted to say thank you to everyone who was involved in my visit to Clarkson. I've been really blown away by the hospitality um, and I've really appreciated the personal touches that have come with this. I really want to thank Leah Regal and President Collins and many of the other people that I've interacted with. Mm -hmm.